Welcome back, comrades, to Utopian Cartography, for another expedition into the unknown regions of the future to discover hope, real hope, beyond the illusions handed down to us by previous generations that greed is good and war is inevitable because there'll just never be enough to go around. As George Carlin said, it's all bullshit, folks, and it's bad for you. I'm your host, Neon Felicity, and I'm here to tell you that we can have a positive future. Our guest on today's voyage is Jonah Paul, a dedicated proletarian activist and housing rights advocate and co-chair of the Sacramento chapter of Democratic Socialists of America. We met last year on the DSA Housing Committee, where we strategized about the most effective way to respond to California's housing crisis, which led us to campaigning for Prop 10, knocking on doors and educating our fellow citizens about the need to lift a statewide ban on municipal rent control. Prior to that experience, I was more of a spectator in my relationship with politics, because I had felt like there was nothing we poor folk could really do to fight the big money power structure that runs our world. We're still a long way off from achieving real reforms, and rent control itself is only an incremental change, but Jonah makes a great case that it will be a transformative step in the direction we need to go, towards a world where housing is considered a human right, guaranteed to every person, rather than just another commodity at the whims of the marketplace. In the conversation you're about to hear, we discuss the philosophy of democratic socialism and how DSA is growing at huge speeds in response to both the impending neo-fascist threat and the rise of an unapologetically socialist movement in this country to demand the economic rights already afforded to citizens of most other developed countries around the world. We explore the path to building the power of the working class through coalescing around issues we care deeply about and politicizing folks who are exploited by their bosses and landlords but have been told to accept that this is just the way things are. The circumstances we struggle under were created by public policy. They are not dictated to us by any law of nature. Modern markets are man-made creations. By the same mechanisms that capitalists use to keep us in poverty, we can liberate ourselves if we take sustained, organized action. Jonah and I talk about the current state of affairs in the housing market, and some of the specific policies that have been implemented over the past half century that have led California into this housing crisis we're suffering where rich people domestically and abroad use our real estate as a tax shelter, and developers are only incentivized to build strip malls and luxury condos, and why the trickle-down approach of just building more housing will not help the working class. We explore the mechanics of how rent control works, and how it corrects for the market's natural tendency to produce inequality, and how it fights back against gentrification and displacement in poor communities by granting actual legal rights to tenants so they are not so vulnerable to the whims of their landlords. Jonah describes some real living models of decommodified housing policies in other countries, many of which have actually completely eliminated homelessness, a serious problem that is currently only growing in numbers in America. He also explains the distinction between public housing and social housing, the latter being a more humane, emancipatory approach that can truly provide dignified shelter for people for the long term. Finally, we talk about how the fruits of our advanced industrial economy ought to be more equitably distributed across society, and how the contrary can only be defended by reference to aristocratic traditionalism. The logic of egalitarianism is actually very simple. We conclude by discussing what it would mean for society to be organized in a way that truly delivers on the promise of freedom and justice for all. So thanks for joining us on this map-making endeavor to discover the path towards a world worth living in. All right, welcome everybody to Utopian Cartography. Uh, in this expedition, I'm joined by Jonah Paul, a social organizer and activist that has really inspired me about the efficacy and urgency of actually trying to deal with this shit. So, welcome Jonah. Thank you, thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely. kind of wanted to start off by, I guess, just mentioning that I've been really, you know, inspired by your dedication to this stuff, because, you know, I, I have that vision of the, the future and how it should go, and the vision of the present and how it's fucked up and there's a, that gulf between the two that I feel like I've been inspired by you and trying to actually take the steps that need to be taken for us to get towards a world worth living in. And there's so much shit that's fucked up that it's like it's easy to once you know about what's going on to just be like all right then whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess my my first question I guess would be to be like what gives you the motivation to to, to fight on these issues and to keep Keep battling, even though there's so much power and money to interest trying to keep things the way they are. Yeah, should I give a little background? Oh, yes. Do that, and then I'll tell you why. Right. So, first of all, I'm co-chair of the Sacramento chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America, and this is my second year as co-chair and third year in the executive board of the organization. I joined DSA in 2016 after Trump was elected. But I've been involved in radical politics since I was about 16 years old. I was listening to uh, punk music in high school. 
and that turned me on to anarchism through the music of uh, the band Crass. Right, totally. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> and, like, so I was like a... I had a Crass patch on my backpack in high school. Nice, <laughs> yes. So I was the anarchist kid, and there was another guy that was like real, really into rage, and he was the uh, Marxist. Right. But now, all grown up, I'm much more of a Marxist, not really an anarchist anymore. But that's a long story you don't need to get into. That all said, um, I spent like my 20s doing anarchisty things, mm -hmm. protest hopping and uh, direct actions and food not bombs, like serving people kind of stuff. I started to get kind of disappointed with uh, both my comrades in the anarchist uh, milieu and also kind of getting disappointed with the just sheer uh, inefficacy of the kinds of stuff that we were focused on. and. Uh, I never went to college, so I didn't really, you know, I was all self-educated and I kind of was hitting the wall or so it felt, both in like my personal life and like activism and stuff. So I, I checked out and I went to school and uh, studied philosophy, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it gave me some ideas or at least helped me learn how to think a little better. Exactly. That's why I think of it. I studied philosophy yeah. in college too. And that's why I think about it. Okay. They, 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 nice. To teach you how to think. Yeah. <laughs> but it didn't really like give me, or I didn't really find that guy, any guidance in it. Right. I wound up kind of graduated from college and like kind of adrift right. back at my parents' house, trying to get a job. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, it was like 2012 when I graduated. So anyway, I was like kind of reconciled to the way things were. Like I had participated in Occupy to the extent that I could, but that kind of petered out. And I was like, well, I, these are just the way things are now. And I didn't really have any radicals or like any groups like that. So anyway. Totally. This is all sounding very familiar. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to start a Jacobin group at one point, like a Jacobin reading group, just mm -hmm. to, to read that, you know, the magazine. Yeah. Um, and like, I didn't really know anybody and wasn't like really sure where to start. I like, contacted the magazine. They gave me some tips, but it never came together. I even checked out DSA or I tried to. And um, there was like a meeting listed on their calendar. So I went to the space. I was like, eh, I mean... Democratic Socialism, you know, uh, check it out, you know? And mm -hmm. so I go to the space where it's supposed to be at and it's just closed, lights off. And I'm like, oh, okay, this group's not, this is a joke. Mm -hmm. All right. And so, you know, I was doing my own thing. And then, like, Trump got elected. I mean, I like not to do my own thing. Like, I tried to help with the minimum wage, fight for 15, mm -hmm. and like increase the minimum wage. But by and large, I didn't really find a group that I could like be a part of to really make change. I wasn't going to join the Democrats, uh, you mm -hmm. know, so. But then, Trump got elected. I was totally, like, floored that someone like that, you know, like, basically changed the political map overnight, and it was terrifying. And I was like, this is so dangerous and fucked up, I have to... Can I swear on the show? Yeah. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta do something, and so I joined. I joined, I was like, people were joining DSA online. And I was like, well, you know, whatever. Like, what What could it hurt? You know, right. I gotta do something. I gotta organize. You can't just, like, accept this bullshit. Like, so I and a lot of other people joined. And uh, I guess that's, that's the prehistory. Right, <laughs> totally. Hell yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that you got into DSA by, uh, it's almost like an opposite of how I got into it. Because you got into it at, by someone terrible getting elected, and I, I got into it by from AOC getting elected. So I, I got into it being like, oh, so wait, a socialist can get somewhere in politics now? Like, yeah. and, and I, I wonder to what extent Trump is responsible for some of that. Because I remember yeah. there was this big debate about whether Trump would ultimately be good to rally the left. I, you know, as someone with white privilege, I didn't, I, I felt uh, like I couldn't say that because I, you know, I'm obviously not going to be the one that's going to bear the brunt of the bad things that happen under the election of something, someone like that. But like Jimmy Dore, for example, was, was saying that, that, that Trump would actually, you know, rally the left and Hillary would, you know, put this left back to sleep. Cause in the same way that like, like during the, during Obama, I was just like, okay, I guess this is how it is. You know, like yeah. I was so inspired in 2008. I fucking cried during his inaugural address. I remember sitting there being like, all right, these wars are going to end. And we're yeah. going to shut down Gitmo and we're going to deal with inequality. And none of that happened. No. <laughs> so yeah, um, I was very disillusioned by all that. And then yeah. The rise of, I guess, the De Justice Democrats and some of that. I, I didn't even know. I, I hadn't even heard of DSA before yeah. before AOC. So was was 
DSA was did they have much of a presence before like twenty like how much did did they explode after oh, Trump, yeah. got, Trump got elected? Uh, a lot. Um, <laughs> it was like six thousand people after the burning campaign, right? And then it went to like twenty two thousand people like by January, right? So totally. But then the real amazing thing is like that it doubled again with AOC, right? Um, just goes to show you like there are some limits to like the. Mm -hmm. Fear, as far as like a organizing incentive, I think that um, right. hope is a lot more powerful for most people. Right, totally. a positive vision for what the world can be, rather than like, mm -hmm. like <laughs> the vision of the apocalypse. Right, exactly. Um, which is unfortunate because we get bombarded with visions of the apocalypse all the time in the media. Right, um, right. It would be helpful if that actually motivated people to do anything. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's part of why I, in trying to come up with a framework for a show I kind of came up with this utopian I wanted to ground my what I what I want to put out there in the world in ter in uh, utopian terms because it's like so I remember there was this one little um thing I clipped out of a magazine at one point that said effective leaders and movements tap into our fantasies about the future not the past mm. and so that was part of what made me want to you know, because I, I was very dystopian for a long time, and I, I thought that we, things were only just going to keep getting worse until we're, we all basically are destroyed in some catastrophic event. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like I think of fascism as like a regression to, you know, wanting to go back to theocracy and trying to, you know, reverse integration and stuff like that. So I want to do this thing of like showing people we know we can have a different future mm -hmm. you know we don't have to preserve whatever parts of the present we like you know in yeah. just in order to stave off this menace because i've noticed that when i talk to people about politics a lot of them are just you know i'm listening to you know podcasts on on the road when i have passengers and a lot of them are like oh yeah this is why i don't pay attention to politics you know uh -huh. a lot of times because they're like yeah this is bad shit i don't even want to think about it yeah <laughs> dsa has given me very give, give me a lot of uh inspiration and hope just because they're just just, just just to see how many other people are fighting for a better world and and fighting for real positive things because you know, yeah. it can be easy to think like we're the only one you know because the whole mainstream media is just mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I think, like, for one of the incredible things about DSA is, like, okay, you go to a meeting for your first time, and you meet a bunch of strangers that feel exactly the same way that you do. Right. And, like, you're like, wow, like, I didn't have to, you know, like, beat around the bush or, like, approach shit from a protective kind of, you know, like, being, like, just conservative in the approach. You just, like, you know, capitalism sucks, and everyone's like, yeah, I fucking hate it. And then, <laughs> right. uh, we need socialism. I mean, right. it's so refreshing, because uh, everywhere you go, you know, like, people can't have these conversations. So, I mean, it's getting better, but um, the nice thing about DSA is that it's just that space where, you're, where those are very easy conversations to have, and you can meet a lot of people that, that share that um way of thinking which is cool right totally hell yeah definitely yeah i think that seems like one of the most one of the one of the greatest parts about social organizing in general it's mm -hmm. just this like this like injection of life or something yeah. yeah i guess the other question is does it feel like we're making progress with movement building like does it well or in your like in the chapter years? or in the, the, the like in the country um i guess both so nationwide dsa has been involved in a lot a lot of, I couldn't name them all, actually, all the different kinds of things that we've been involved in. But I think, like, there's a, a lot of flexibility and uh, freedom of every chapter to kind of figure out what's best for its own, what's strategic mm. for its region or its city or, it, or wherever they happen to yeah. be. But, um, so, like, in the case of, like, New York with AOC, they were the largest volunteer base for her campaign. Um, and so she had the, a special place for their logo on her campaign material and stuff. Right. And uh, yeah, they made up about 20%, which is to say she brought a lot of other volunteers with her too. Right. She's a pretty amazing person. Totally. But a DSA put, also believed in AOC and put in a lot of work to help her beat the machine in New York. Right. Uh, which is really amazing. I mean, it really took everyone in that. I think it's, if you're... On the West Coast, it's kind of hard to 
put in the context, but they really the Democrats have a really strong hold of that city. Even to the it's yeah, it's like a I, I don't want to get too um, bogged down in the details, but because right. didn't he run un, didn't Crowley run unopposed like four three or four times in a row? Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, it's it wasn't even viewed as worth challenging him because it's just like so this they have such a stranglehold. Mm-hmm. And he inherited the seat, didn't he? <laughs> he doesn't live there, yeah. He doesn't live in the district, so... Uh, but ASE's approach was interesting because, um, one, they used, they had a multilingual campaign talking to people that don't necessarily get talked to, or usually don't, in uh, New York politics. Um, there's a lot of different um, linguistic communities in uh, the Bronx. The other thing is that uh, they talked to a lot of white millennials that got displaced and are gentrifying the Bronx and they don't like to it. Like that's the thing with like a lot of the millennials don't like gentrification. They don't want to be a part of it, but they're also kind of like a pawn in this like real estate game. Totally. And, uh, you don't have a lot of freedom, you know, to just move wherever you want. Right. Right. I mean, some people will try to argue that, but I would argue that they're not being realistic. Mm-hmm. But the thing is like, they don't like, they don't like it if they had their, choice like they wouldn't want to be in that situation and they chose the candidate who they saw as like being able to fight those kinds of forces the forces of rampant real estate speculation you know rent extraction uh, and uh, exploitation right yeah that makes sense uh, yeah I, I remember i had one passenger but one time i was listening to some podcast about gentrification and this girl was like yeah i hate it i live in oakland i i know i'm a gentrifier but i but i love oakland I've heard, I've gotten that feeling that people like know that they're part of this thing. I love that a pawn in the game. Like, so one thing that I, I've noticed that you know I, I feel like the mainstream media is trying real, real hard to blur the distinction between socialism and dem- democratic socialism. Mm-hmm. And, and so I guess maybe one thing to to explain to anyone listening that might be hazy on that distinction is like, what exactly. Sure. How would you... I mean, it's not one um, particular doctrine. Like, uh, unlike other forms of socialism, it's a pretty big umbrella of different ways of thinking. Right. But I think that the basic tenets of it is that that socialism can be achieved through the democratic mechanisms that exist in society right. uh, as it is, and that they don't require the that you can do it without the violent overthrow of the, of the system. Right. Um, and so that would be different from socialists who believe that you must have a, a violent revolution in order to right. um, create a worker state. Right. So do the existing lovers of government um, have a have a mechanism to, you know, for example, nationalize the oil industry mm. or nationalize the banks or... I mean, like there are the means to nationalize some industries, in particular finance. That exists within the U.S. I think... Uh, yeah, because uh, the Federal Reserve is only 100 years old. I think our, our system of representative democracy is particularly difficult to achieve the ends of democratic socialism, but Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders is running again for president. I think that's the best hope we have of changing um, how politics is done in the United States. Mm -hmm. And unless we're going to be like completely utopian and not think about material realities, Mm -hmm. we got to focus our energies there. Uh, The other, this idea of like, even supposing like democratic socialism was like a fool's errand or something like that, Mm -hmm. and that it could never really attain socialism. Um, we have to look at the material, our material reality and ask, can we in the next 12 years have a revolutionary movement for socialism? I think like, if you have your eyes open, that that's not like really in the cards. Right. And we have 12 years before we have ecological uh, collapse. So uh, we do need something drastic and that might require collective action in a way that we haven't seen. However, um, I'm not very optimistic about those kind of socialists' views of uh, change because I just don't think that our time frames match. And, you know, like, uh, I care much more about the existence of the world than uh, rigid doctrines, you know.
Right. Totally. I know when people attack Bernie from the left and say they're not going to vote for him because he's not radical enough, I'm just like, what do you expect? Like, what? He's right, he's right on the edge of the Overton window. He's put he's pers- he's pushing that left edge of the Overton window. I mean. So anything further to the left of him, it's just not going to fly with the popular, you know, it's not going to be... We're very fortunate to have him running. I, you don't have to think that he's uh, perfect or even great. You just have to think about how the fuck are we going to um, live, you know, for the next 30 years? And what do we have to do today to get there? You know, um, mm-hmm. we don't want to just like sh- put our ha- heads in the sand, you know? Right. Um, but uh, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. so democratic socialism is this umbrella of beliefs, different beliefs about using um, democratic means, uh, the ballot box, uh, representatives in um, government as it is. Um, in addition to social action, labor organizing mm. because it's only by the working class that we're going to really have the disruptive power to get these kinds of demands met right. so it takes concerted action not just electorally but organizing communities organizing workplaces in order to overcome the forces of the ownership class the bourgeoisie you know that's the that's it in a nutshell democratize the economy you know politicize it and um, give workers control you know, demo- have a democratic say over how they produce, how they live, how they participate in society at large, you know. And I mean workers as broadly as right. possible. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like the 99% basically, but those who don't own, you know, make their income off of passive dividends on stocks and <laughs> right. you know, assets and stuff like that. Right, right exactly. Yeah, I saw me recently that said, uh, socialism is not a system where people get paid off of the work of others you're thinking of capitalism <laughs> it's a crazy pr move that capitalism has been has managed to do to like oh there's a great thing uh, michael brooks was talking about i forget the author he was uh, describing that said it but he was saying that like a lot of what some of these people are doing is like the inverse of the marxist story where they basically say that the capital class is being exploited like when we talk about raising the top marginal tax rate they're yeah. And you know, like when people talk about, oh, the you know the top one percent, you know they they pay you know thirty percent of the taxes or whatever. Right. But they got ninety percent of the money. <laughs> um, so it's like they they turn around and act like they're the ones being exploited. The capital class acts like we're trying to exploit them. Like, wh- whereas they're in the middle of exploiting us. They yeah. only got to where they're at by exploiting us. Um, so it seems like that's part of the to flip that story is to show like that the workers are doing all the production and so therefore they should be the ones in control of it rather than uh-huh. some share, some shareholders or is that, some people like to say the workers should be able to enjoy the fruits of their labor right yeah i mean i don't know that seems like a, t- a basic attempt right like decency <laughs> and like a good society so (laughs) right right exactly (laughs) totally so um richard wolf talks about democracy in the workplace and he's all about um that whole the workers of companies controlling what they produce and how they produce it and what to do with the surplus and so i've been wondering if if that model is if it's compatible with a big a broader level democratization of the economy Mm. or if if those are intention, if like individual corporations being democratized mm. versus the whole industry is being democratized, are those, do you think those things go hand in hand? Um, are cooperatives in tension with state ownership? Right. I think there's ways of synthesizing it. I don't know. Um, I haven't really given it a lot of thought, but, um, you know, and I imagine like sometimes like firms are um, leased or mm. something like that. From the government? From the government, yeah, yeah. That's the way that... Or there could be a lot of... I, I'm not really sure, like, what that would look like. You know, you know, it's kind of hard to speculate about what workplace democracy looks like down the road, but um, right. you have, like, kinds of examples of, you know, cooperatives and stuff today that um, right. 
that, I mean, there's like a bakery in San Francisco uh, or in the Bay Area. There's several locations. They're all successful. I forget. Right. I forget its name right now, but you know, like there's definitely uh, models out there. I have some friends in like the foothills who are trying to start a cooperative farm. Right. I don't think they have to be intention. In particular, I think like the government's, the state has more of a uh, responsibility to uh, intervene in finance. Right. And to really take, totally. take that over more than like in this or that right. industry. I mean, totally. the, the financial industry like has to really be completely altered. Right. Uh, yeah, Obama fucked up. <laughs> Not, he had an opportunity there. Like, I just, I feel like, like when when I have passengers that are like, well, Bill Obama was trying to do the right thing. What makes you think he was that he wasn't on our side? And I'm like, um, well, because he bailed out the banks instead of the homeowners. That's the first thing I go to because it's yeah. like, yeah, he could have canceled the debt. Yeah, totally. So uh, I guess uh, maybe uh, we can transition into talking about housing because um, sure. I I know that's your specialty kind of and uh, focus and yeah. And uh, so I think that trying to re trying to establish the framework of thinking about shelter and housing mm-hmm. as a human right and rather than just as a commodity that, you know, when people talk about when, like when people have a, a position against rent control, they're usually like, oh, well, you know, who is the government to say what, what rent prices should be? You know, I shouldn't have to be subsidized when some poor person's, you know, yeah. rent somewhere. And right. why don't you just go live in Idaho where rent's cheaper? Or right. Yeah, why not? I wonder. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> right. But it's, so I guess maybe my my question would be like, is that the best fr- is that the best way to you know is, are those the best terms to be making the argument to people is that that housing is a human is a right rather than you know just a commodity you know for the to, up to the whims of the marketplace. Yeah, I mean, um, I I did have done a lot of DSA Sacramento has like been really involved in getting rent control in Sacramento, and we've helped to get a rent control measure on the ballot, um, hopefully for March or, or no, we're not sure if it's March or November, but within a year to a year and a half, we'll have rent control on the ballot, which means that Sacramento will get to decide whether we can set rents at a reasonable rate, um, have eviction protection so landlords can't evict a tenant for no reason, and so forth. I was making arguments to people originally, like when I first started doing it, that, yeah, like if I came um, to somebody who was like kind of stubborn like that, I would mm-hmm. say like, oh, well, do you own your home? I see, like, and what's your objection, like, uh, to rent control? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's about your property value. Well, then mm-hmm. I'll appeal to your greed. But mm-hmm. I don't do that anymore. Um, you can't persuade people like that very much anyway. Mm-hmm. Um and you don't want to reinforce that, you know, like mm-hmm. you don't want to reinforce like this myth mm-hmm. about what, you know, property is. Um, right. And like, so like, yeah, I do believe that the framing as a, as a right is really important. Um, we have to look at like what um, land really is because it's not as if any land is intrinsically valuable you know like if that were the case we'd build houses like in the desert you know what we do but like (laughs) no reframe that we don't like there's parts there's huge expanses of land that have no developments on them at all right they're considered uninhabitable so inhabitability has something to do with like what makes land have some kind of value. Right. But there's lots of habitable land that's also undeveloped. So it's not just that it's habitable. So like certain places have accumulated all of the, you know, wealth and riches of civilization and some places haven't. Right. And there's long histories to why that's the case that go back to colonization um, or even before that. But, um, you know, it also has to do with the way that we survive and the way that we um, feed ourselves and all these things. So um, that all factors into it. But um, fast forward to like where we're at today. And if you're having a conversation with most people, um, if they're skeptical about like controlling the property value of um, or like Mm -hmm. controlling the value of rents on, on property, 
they're going to say something like, well, isn't this a supply and demand issue? Isn't it just going to go away with if we just build enough? Mm. Um, and at some abstract level, yeah, that's true. Mm. But we have to look at how building actually occurs, not how it happens in our heads. You right. know? We only build to meet certain demands, not every need. So like mm -hmm. lots of people are just completely left out of the um, development of housing. Um, they happen to be poor people of color um, and not by chance that's the mm -hmm. design of the system itself. Mm -hmm. But the only way around these historical trends is like to intervene with our power and so yeah rent control is a very mild way to do that yeah, um totally. people like kind of treat it like oh the sky's falling kind of stuff like yeah. my property value is going to drop to two percent or something like right. your property value increased like 30 percent last year what are you worried about <laughs> right. the other thing is that it, it's not stopping people from making money on um and speculating on real estate, which mm. is fundamentally what, as socialists, we want to do away with. So, like, rent mm. control is, like, super piecemeal. Mm. It's just a little bit band-aid mm. on a huge problem, but it is an important step. Mm. There's a lot of other things that come along with it that we could get into, but, like, at the core, it, it does kind of signify to uh, voters, like, the housing you do have a rights to housing. Right. Because um, right now you don't. Like, a landlord can check right. your rent up um, 200%. Uh, if they give you six, 60 days notice, you know, they can, right. um, they can evict you on a whim, you know, because uh, they don't like you or they think they see the dollar signs flash in their eyes and think, like, oh, I can renovate. Right. Um, and that's mostly going to um, fall on the you know, like lower third of the, of income earners. Right. And primarily people of color and women because our system is designed that way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I wonder how much Prop 10 fell, you know, broke down along renter versus homeowner lines. Is, oh, is yeah. Is there any data on that? Uh, well, um, I did the, I crunched the numbers for Sacramento and it actually didn't lose by that much in mm. Sacramento. Okay. I only lost by about 2%, which is pretty decent for, yeah. for like, they didn't spend a lot of money here in terms of trying to win. Right. Um, I worked on the Prop 10 campaign on one portion of it, long, kind of complicated story, but there were two parallel campaigns, one controlled by an eccentric guy who had lots of money and one that was more like run by tenant organizations. I was in the tenant organizations one. It did really well in districts four and five, which are very heavy in renters. It kicked ass uh, there. They won in those districts. Right. It did not win overall in the state. It did not win overall in the city. But in a lot of cities in California, it did actually come out on top in the Bay. Actually, every city with rent control did. Right. Because, okay, for all those who do not know what Prop 10 is, it was designed to help cities determine um, how much rent control they could have, how strong a rent control they can have. Because right now there are strong limits by the state that were imposed in 1995 by a bill that's called Costa Hawkins. Those limits are, you can't apply rent control to buildings built after 1995. Cities can't apply rent control to single family homes and condos. And any unit that has rent control when a tenant moves out, the landlord can raise the rent back to market rate, whatever that is in a city. So those three things combined make rent control a little more ineffective. Well, a lot more in some cities. It depends how much of the housing stock is new or old, but it gives uh, landlords, especially corporate landlords, uh, I will get into corporate landlords in a second, but gives them a huge loophole to um, make whatever they want in uh, rents. Are those trend lines going more towards corporate landlords or are more and more landlords 
you know, I guess consolidating, I guess, and yeah, oh, yeah. And being turned into financial assets. <laughs> yeah. So uh, after the um, financial cr crash, the crisis, uh, there was a buy up of single family homes that were affordable for new homeowners. They were all bought up by companies like um, Blackstone Equity. Um, or invitation homes, or there's a couple of other like Wall Street companies that bought these up because they saw that just like with um, banks loaning to people before, they had securitized loans in order to make lots of money and have like really loose control over credit so that more and more people would buy homes. And they packaged all this up as uh, securities that they traded on the market and made tons of money with and just kept on speculating and creating this bubble. After the crash, they're like, well, we can't, it's not, that's not going to work. At least not right now. We need something else. Oh, look, like all of these homes have been foreclosed on. We can buy them for like next to nothing and we can rent them and we can uh, create securities based on the property title and the future return on rents because uh, rent on single family homes can't be controlled. Uh, <laughs> so um, the largest private property owner in um, Sacramento County is Invitation Homes. The second is the, the county itself. So <laughs> Invitation Homes owns like thousands of homes here um, that you can't own. So that restricts the supply of, you know, homes for um, young families and young workers who want to get their first home. It's all messed up. So Costa Hawkins is, contributes to it, but Wall Street is the driver, and Prop 10 was an attempt to kind of give control back to communities rather than to Wall Street banks, and uh, it just didn't make it but there is a, a new bill in the legislature to do like kind of a partial repeal of Costa Hawkins. Hopefully that goes a little further than the last one they tried, mm. um, which got killed like immediately. <clears throat> the, re the developers, the realtors, the landlords, they have a really strong hold over our government. So anything that's remotely giving like, you know, table scraps to renters is like viewed as like the end of the world, you know, and they'll just throw it at all their money at it to try and stop it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, is it, so I guess maybe that just as a, almost, almost a side note, I'm curious if, does, you know, they put 75, 80 million dollars or something against, the, you just in ads against Prop 10. So I was, I've heard people talking shit about California's um, direct ballot measure system. Like, do you think that we would have better luck that, w by, lobbying legislators them to pass a bill or to do a, some sort of direct you know um, yeah direct ballot kind of measure like prop 10 because obviously they're going to do the same thing anytime we try to do anything i'll put a hundred sure. million dollars worth of ads yes there is a problem with the direct democratic uh procedures we have in california because they've been hijacked by special interests they were originally created in order to be a check on special interests right but then the you know their special interests realize, oh, you just need a million dollars and you can get anything you want on the ballot. You don't have to go through the legislature or lobby or anything. Right. This is genius. Like, why the hell would we ever lobby? Right. <laughs> just pass everything uh, through the people. And it's, right. they've been pretty successful. So, but the problem with just doing away with that is that our legislature is also not effective because we've weakened it so much. And also, well, we've we both weakened it in terms of We've made it both politicians less competent because the term limits are super short, yeah. which was the result of another proposition. Right. The other thing is that there's just not enough representation. Like state senators have like huge swaths of land right. that they're like representatives of. And there's just no way that you know your legislator or you can even talk to them. So that's totally going to change. Do you want to um, go after the direct democratic? mechanisms because you need way more representation in order to have more democratic means we can't, you can't just have like you know one uh, representative for tens and tens of thousands of Californians like stupid like it really needs to be like one for like 5,000 Californians or something like right that. yeah that would make more sense for yeah, sure like basically like have a California parliament is what we need Right. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so we would need to have some kind of like rewrite of the entire constitution of, the Cal of California. Right, right, totally.
Is no, Cal- no, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, is California gerrymandered particularly? Really? It's better here than other states because uh, there's a commission that does a decent job of um, preventing it from getting too messed up. Right, totally. So yeah, that's not as big a factor here as like North Carolina, where it's like completely, it's like a one party state. So right. I mean, we're a one party state in a different kind of way. But there, it's like completely artificial. It's not because of Republicans are just that popular. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Totally. So yeah, I guess uh, I've been I've been reading articles and stuff, and there's a lot of people talking about how the crisis is just the, sh- the shortage. You know, like in a couple places, I was seeing uh, the number. We have a, a shortage of 3.5 million housing units or something, mm-hmm. and so they're like we just need to build more housing like and yeah. so i guess i was wondering i guess why won't that help because there's always a shortage for the working class because we don't build, build for working people we only build at the very top segment of the economy mm-hmm. for lifestyle renters people who don't even need to rent but do just choose to and then so there's like actually different classes of housing mm-hmm. and class b and class c are where all of the um speculation uh, goes on that like really hurts people that's not being addressed at all and it won't be by the economy alone it has to be so like I, what I really love is like how many people talk about like oh we just need to build more mm-hmm. we need to build more I'm like okay look at the cities where they built more that was uh, in order to like help working people those were direct interventions that took away land from from the private industries and like leveled slums and built like huge social housing programs um, or at the very least like highly subsidized um, housing projects okay like that is not what they're advocating at all they're advocating for the same people who are responsible right. for the way our housing is to like handle the problem Right. They're never going to do it because they make too much money right. by the status quo. Just- Gavin Newsom said he's going to have a Marshall Plan on housing. Gavin Newsom's only listening to the people who funded the No on Prop 10 campaign. Right. He hasn't talked to a single tenant organization. He's just not the person for the job, unfortunately. He got the coronation, you know, who's going to run against him, right? Some people did, but they didn't right. get very far. Right. So. We can't keep relying on this myth that the market will resolve itself. It hasn't. The market is like not some kind of intelligent being out there that like does things all on its own. It's controlled by decisions of the state. It always has been. And you're just like completely full of fantasies if you think that it's just like a self-regulating like entity that exists outside of human minds, you know? <laughs> oh. And uh, yeah, so one th- one framework that I like is that the the idea of that the market has a natural tendency to create inequality to like tend towards the concentration of wealth and the and the pauperization of the mass of people, yeah. and that the democratic process is to try to correct for that. So it seems like leveraging something like the state, I guess, to to create rent control would be the only thing that could counteract that stratifying. You know, yeah force of the marketplace and so i guess i guess maybe one question for people who don't know who don't know much about rent control does it cost the government money to create rent control does it subsidize the portion of the rent that is being capped oh sure I'll, yeah here's how it works it's a a cost neutral policy what makes it cost neutral is that the cost to run the program is uh, raised by a fee on landlords something like 50 to $80 a year um, per unit. It's nothing to a landlord at all, no matter how much they cry. And the way that it's controlled is that there's a rent board and they take a look at the economic indicator called the consumer price index, which is a fancy term for something that tracks inflation. So they look at what inflation is, this consumer price index, and they say, okay, Rent for this year is capped at 100% of the consumer price index. And what that translates to in regular terms is that the rent is capped somewhere between probably 3 and 6%, depending on inflation on average. So that means that within that year, a landlord is only allowed one time to raise the rent the full, let's say, 
four percent and it was set at four percent and so if they go above that they have to produce valid reasons for doing so that have to be something like a necessary fix like an improvement on the building they can pass that on like if they wanted to if you have a hole in your ceiling that you didn't do that's not going to be valid reason to rent raise the rent because like the landlord has the responsibility to keep the property inhabitable and so a that's what we're paying rent. That's what we're paying them rent to that's, do. That's what the rent's supposed to do, but it doesn't <laughs> in the real world. Right. But that's what it's supposed to do. The only way they could is if we had lost and force it, and we don't. We have, we have like, very thin laws that inf- to enforce rental inspection programs and stuff like that. That just don't. They don't cut it. You live with like, mold and cockroaches and bats and whatever like you'll, right. see, you see, you'll see it all if you go knock doors but mm-hmm. if you're one of the lucky ones a code enforcement person will come outside your apartment look around and say everything's clear here and leave and that's when you're lucky most people don't get the visit so like that's just like how it <laughs> the how things are now so anyway i'm digressing but the, to return to the point what rent control does is it sets the rents so that you can only increase it x percent annually and then gives kind of a way for tenants to bring problems or for landlords to bring problems to their tenants to someone that's not a court but is still binding Mm. key here is that it's binding because like the uh, Mm -hmm. city council led by steve hansen right now is uh, trying to put out a rental mediation program that doesn't do anything because it can't actually bind anyone to this it's not even a band-aid it's just an insult to our intelligence to the like 25,000 renters in his district. They're trying to like create a smoke screen and say like, oh, we care about renters. Like they don't, but. One thing I ran across a lot while we were canvassing for Prop 10 was just people who were homeowners that they weren't landlords necessarily, but they were like, well, just in case I wanted to rent out one of my rooms, there was one woman who said, I don't want the government telling me how much I can rent out my a room in my house for. They're exempt from our law, so that's great. <laughs> we said we didn't want to control what people do in their own um, in their own home because we know that there are gonna be people like that. you are like, what the hell? What if I want my I want to rent out my spare bedroom? We we decided that wasn't worth the. That's not worth the trouble. You know, that's such a small percentage of uh, landlords. You know, it's probably not even one percent. Not even sure if it's a half a percent. You know. So Mm -hmm. it's like, don't worry about it. Also grandmother units or like the, sorry, in-law units, the ones in people's backyards and stuff. It's just a small factor in the housing market, you know, and we want to encourage those. So So, Olive Branch, okay, like you're a homeowner, you have some spare room or something like that. You know, that's that's your business, um, but treat your renters right, no matter what. (laughs) Don't gouge them. Well, (laughs) the the thing is that like, even though we're not controlling them, the fact that the market it's going to be more regulated means that there's just more stable. They can't really ask these outrageous prices as much because right. that's not what people are going to be used to paying. So. Right, right, totally. Yeah, one thing I've found is that, or noticed, is that I think the biggest impediment to changing a lot of this stuff is that the middle class has been convinced to identify with the bourgeoisie. Mm-hmm. the landlord class even though their interest their economic in, their material interests are actually more in line you know are they're, they're more in our boat but when we try to implement measures to like rein in the top like rein in the wall street landlords yeah. they're somehow able to do this jujitsu and convince people in the middle to lower you know section to be, to fear that as if we're you know we're coming after them but really we're aiming at, at the at the top um and so My instinct in trying to think about these things Mm -hmm. and the crisis and how expensive rent is, is just how many units are vacant? How big of a factor are vacant units in the the high cost of rents? Like, is that part of, is that driving a lot of the shortage? Is just like the, that they're being used as assets that- Uh, I wish I could say that was the case in Sacramento. I think it's a much smaller Mm -hmm. factor here in the Valley than it is on the coast. There you have lots of offshore money, you know, like being parked from like China and Russia because those, those are less risky investments than maybe keeping your money in a bank right. in Russia or China. Mm-hmm. So people like invest it into real estate that they may, may or may not seek to get rents from or not very proactively because um, mm-hmm. that's like not the main purpose of it. It's more like just a stable way to 
hold the money. So that's a big problem in like Vancouver or San Francisco, um, Los Angeles. Miami is really bad, New York. But it hasn't really uh, come in Sacramento the same way, as to my knowledge. Right. We have pretty low vacancy rate. I think yeah. it's like around 2.3%, which is great if you're a landlord, but not great for renters. So, mm-hmm. you know, like having slack in the, su- in the supply, you know, in theory, it's practical, but uh, it has to be done right. And that doesn't happen on its own, unfortunately. So in those places, would a tax on, vac- would a vacancy tax help? It seems like a... Um, a reasonable wager that uh, one of the reasons they park money into real estate is to like preserve the value of their right. money is, or like increase it um, and if they're taking a hit then they're less likely to use real estate that way mm-hmm. it sh- probably should be nationwide mm-hmm. uh, not just like in cities but mm-hmm. like the whole country because there's lots of ways that people use real estate as a tax shelter one of the most important laws to ever be passed in California, Prop 13, which has been described as like rent control for homeowners, but that's not what it is. <laughs> what Prop 13 is, is a proposition passed in 1978 to freeze property taxes at pre like Prop 13 rates. The reason they did that was because there was like a tax assessing crisis where the elderly were getting charged so much in property taxes in some instances they couldn't even afford to live anymore and so there was a actual problem exacerbated by a very arrogant democratic party that had a lot of had a lot of success decades of success in california Mm -hmm. we didn't treat the problem with the right gravity and opened up the door for a populist tax revolt it also happened to be a time of drastic change in California, where California was once one of the whitest state, was the whitest state in the country, and it became mm. a very diverse state in a very short time. Interesting. Yes. And so there was like two parts of this like movement. One was a racial component, a reaction to changing demographics um, by white homeowners, by and large. And then the mm. other part was like, kind of a uh, popular dissatisfaction with the government in particular with tax assessments and what happened is uh they got their way and froze their property tax in time and it deprived the state of billions of dollars right. it also centralized spending in the state capital where it used to be done at the city level or the county mm. level which meant that lobbyists could then focus all their attention on one place right. uh, and it shifted the incentives of cities because they could no longer rely on the income from um, property taxes for their own uh, general funds right. unless it came from business real estate right. like non-residential real estate right. so that's why you see the increase in like all these stupid strip malls, strip malls and stuff yeah and it's so and, like, it's crazy yeah so right. that like and it's off like right. they've taken away like the incentive for cities to help uh, create more housing. Right. At the same time, you created these tax shelters, and people will cling to their their tax assessment, not even necessarily their house, because another proposition got passed so that they could move it as long as it was in the same uh, county. I think they can transfer their tax uh, assessment to an, a different home, even Whoa. a new home, and right. keep the low what? rate. <laughs> Oh, it's totally, it's totally uh, messed up, but mm-hmm. they've gone in a great deal and renters haven't. But the, there was a New York Times, or sorry, LA Times article that came out that, said, that discovered that something like 60% of these homes are being rented. The people live in a different home right. and are just, you know, pay nothing in property taxes and are taking in all this rent at the same time. So Jeff Bridges is one of them. So screw you, Jeff Bridges. <laughs> right. Master. Damn it. Yeah, sorry. No, the dude, the dude. That's not very cool of you, dude. <laughs> you know, like how the dude is Bella, but... Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so like, in addition to vacant homes, there's like also homes that are just like purely artificial profit engines 
that the state is basically subsidizing because that's income we're not getting as Californians. Mm. That's going straight in the pocket of some jackass like Jeff Bridges, who <laughs> I respect for his acting, but not for his greed. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. Yeah, seriously. Out of all the things to do with you, Hollywood money, man. <laughs> millionaire on you independently. You don't have to rent your home for more. Uh, Passive uh, income, man. It's a drug. <laughs> they need help. They need to go and uh, we need to send them to the like the anti Nancy Reagan <laughs> like passive income recovery. Right. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I guess maybe a, a, another question we touched on a little bit, but. Um, how, how would rent control fight gentrification? How would, you know, minimizing the, the available profit in gentrifying a neighborhood? Because yeah. the way I think of it is like these capitalists, the, the monetary incentive is the only language they speak. So it seems like in some cases that seems like the monetary disincentive like is, uh -huh. is the only way. The appeal to moral arguments like, yeah, it's a right, like, and so that, that, that can get, that can garner a broad-based support, but in terms of actually forcing or, you know, getting the people with their hands on the power or the money to yeah. do it is I think right now like the main thing that like makes gentrification completely unstoppable is that community members are displaced before they know what they can do about it uh, there isn't totally. a lot of organ in Sacramento in particular it's not really a runner's movement yet it's building but it's not to the point that we've got in like the coastal cities LA you have an amazing tenants union. San Francisco's got a great tenants union. Oakland, Berkeley, they've you know these are decades old institutions. Some of them, not LA, that was new, which and very impressive. But the thing that rent control can do simply by providing what it does is it keeps people in their homes, and that just at least you know it's not going to stop people right. from doing all the other kinds of shenanigans and speculating and creating these shady professional business improvement districts or whatever the hell they call right. it to like kind of create bougie storefronts and mm -hmm. all the other things that go with gentrification. It just makes it a little harder. And that's just gives you enough time to catch your breath and say, okay, let's organize. Like they're like showing us out of our neighborhood, you know, we're, we can't even like right now in Sacramento, you know, rents have um, somewhat leveled off in the urban core, like in the within the grid, but in South Sacramento, they're still going, they're still skyrocketing. Mm, right. And so the speculation doesn't just end when it like levels off in one place. It's displaced. Right. So, and that with that displacement comes a displacement of people. And so it happened first in the urban core and now it's spreading outward like some kind of pandemic. Right, totally. Yeah. <laughs> right. So this is rent control is to stop the pandemic of rent gouging. Right. Uh, blood suckers <laughs> right right totally yeah that makes sense yeah <laughs> so yeah like i guess i had a question about uh if there's any other things besides rent control to fight back against the financialization of housing because you know that's what late stage capitalism is doing is yeah. just financializing everything and creating this epic casino so the yeah. derivatives market is like over a quadrillion dollars now and uh -huh. and so is rent control something that could fight against that it's a very near term a solution to very local problems. So it's not going to fundamentally change our relationship to housing. However, it is a, I believe, transformative for the local community. But what it's not doing is, no, it's not altering the derivatives market, sadly. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that kind of stuff. I mean, like, there are much bigger reforms or alterations to the system that have to occur to do something like truly decommodify housing. Right. Um, yeah, because the because uh, that the concept of decommodifying housing it seems so right. Like that's definitely where we need to go. But it's like it also seems so far. You know, yeah. it seems so lofty and far and utopian in the pejorative sense. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> well, there's living models of it uh, in places like Austria or Sweden or even dare I say Venezuela or, <laughs> or uh, to take a more conservative example of Chile. So uh, there are social housing models in existence that compete with the private sector and you can f learn more about it. There's a report by a group called the people's policy project. 
PPP. Nice. Yeah. And they have a very accessible report on uh, social housing. Social housing is kind of, I guess you could call it like a rebranding of public housing, but there are important differences. I think that the the social housing model is to give way more municipal or even building control to the residents, whereas in like a lot of these older public housing models, like it was really top down. It was always considered a temporary home for people. Like they didn't want, they were openly hostile to the idea that people would live their whole lives in public. Right. housing in the United States. Um, I actually brought a book on that. It's called In Defense of Housing nice. um, by uh, Peter Marcuse and David Madden. Um, it's on Verso Books. Right. And it's a really good introduction to like thinking conceptually about like housing as a human right yeah. and like how housing has been used as a tool for wealth accumulation for the few and how it can be like something for all of us. Right. So definitely worth checking out. There's mention of the right to the city in here. One really important thing is kind of like debunking some of the myths about like public housing in particular. One of the myths is that we really had it in the US, which we never really had like a, a real public housing program, at least not how it should be thought of. And two, like that public housing is in any way bad. It's not, right. uh, it's actually the opposite. Bill, didn't Bill Clinton fuck a lot of that up? Like, didn't the little bit of public housing that we had? I feel like I have this idea in my head that Bill Clinton passed something. I'm going to be ignorant on the history here. I want to say yes, though. Cause Seems like something Bill Clinton would do, right? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I guess I, like, I shouldn't say that because I, I don't know for sure, so look it up. Yeah, look it up. Get back to the show. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, because this whole idea of social housing is something totally new to me. I, I only first heard about it a few months ago, so yeah. I, I imagine that a lot of people don't know about it and yeah. it's still kind of ha a hazy concept in my mind and yeah i think the people's policy project is a great place to start because it really breaks down a couple of different ways that it's been done in the real world right so yeah totally uh real existing utopias not that far away right totally. and with their why they're so interesting is because i mean like take vienna austria yeah. they've eliminated homelessness yeah. because they have a huge supply of public housing and it's all very high quality everyone gets access to the same high quality of housing whether they're very low income or high income and so it breaks down these barriers of these that have segregated their society and things from a better city and it takes off n enormous stressor off of people which is paying too much for housing so it's incredible right um, yeah, i mean totally. it's not like a silver bullet it's not gonna happen on its own but you know, it's, it's, it's helpful. Yeah, totally. So do people pay rent in those? I think they pay, like, uh, at rent, but, like, at a very, very subsidized rate. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think there are models where you just know upfront costs that may be feasible, may not be, I don't know. But, you know, it would depend on other aspects of the state being changed. Right. Yeah, because it seems like the need to pay so much rent is, like, the, the treadmill moving. So it, like, makes us work you know full time or whatever so part yeah. of my my utopian vision is like mm -hmm. the reduction in work hours uh -huh. and so i i see the reduction in rents as uh, instrumental in re reducing the amount of work hours that we have to yeah i mean uh, necessary labor time yeah absolutely like uh it is definitely one of the variables like that's going to impact whether or not we can work more or less no doubt so a lot of people can't even enjoy their homes because they spend all they spend 50 60 hours a week at work to pay the rent on a place that they barely get to be at especially when they got to drive an hour commute because they can't afford to live in the place where they work right okay so the stats on sacramento 50 percent no sorry 54 percent of the renters here pay a third of their income to rent which is outrageous that's like <laughs> totally unacceptable right 30 percent of renters in Sacramento pay over 50% of their wages to rent. That means like if you're factoring in all the costs right. of like living a life in the state of California, they're making crazy sacrifices. They're either not eating, they're cutting something out, they're not going to the doctor. I mean, they're probably living in overcrowded apartments with housing instability comes all kinds of health problems, uh, mental health problems. It is an 
the probably fundamental thing that we need to be providing everybody aside from free health care is housing. If you don't have those two things, you have a very sick society where most people are really spending all their time working, getting very sick, dying early, getting depressed, hurting themselves or others. Mm -hmm. Just really an awful situation. And it's totally preventable. I heard that Kaiser is like looking into the, the housing issue because they, they're recognizing that people aren't able to be, you know, like that they're, you know, they're dealing with a lot of chronic homeless people mm -hmm. that are having all these chronic health problems that are directly caused by their homelessness. Yeah. Yeah. And Kaiser would be one to do that because they won't staff their hospitals with enough mental health care uh, <laughs> professionals in order to give anybody adequate mental health care that they're paying for in the Kaiser system. Which is why we need to abolish private uh, insurance companies. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, yeah, they are doing some kind of funny stuff, you know. But it's sort of like, a, um, with all of these, like, corporations, there's always, you know, fix with one, break with one hand what you're fixing with the other. Right. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's all to your set. Right, totally. But it, I, in terms of, like, the general health care system, I think that's bit, one of the biggest reasons like that it's so disingenuous why the, the mainstream media is just so obsessed with talking about it's gonna cost 32 trillion dollars it's gonna cost 32 trillion dollars but not making the point that it's gonna save money because it almost it's almost obvious that it's gonna save money because without the incentive to keep people sick yeah then there would be an incentive then, then they would be able to actually cert fulfill their function of making people healthy yeah in which case the housing situation would they would need to the, the, the price tag that they throw out there to scare you is actually, has been pointed out also by People's Policy Project, by their director or founder or whatever, uh, Matt Brunick. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, like, that's actually an enormous savings. Like, you're <laughs> proving our point. Thank you. Like, yes, like, that's how much it will cost, which is way less than we pay right now for health care. Wow. <laughs> like a single parent works. <laughs> exactly. Who would have thought? Mm -hmm. right. It's almost in every... Uh, industrialized country yet. Yeah, that's the craziest thing about it. People say, oh, I don't think we can do it. I still have passengers in San Francisco yeah. that are just like, yeah, no, I, I just don't think we can do it. It's, it's really, that's really far out there. And I'm just like, then how did every other country do it then? You're exceptional. <laughs> I mean, that's... Well, one policy that I'm really excited about that, that I noticed a lot of people on the left are very suspicious about is basic income. Because I'm, I'm really, like I suggested earlier, I'm really focused on how, how do we reduce, reduce necessary labor hours. Yeah. It's, to me, it seems like basic universal basic income mm -hmm. could enable us to, you know, get some of our time back. But when I had a friend who said that if we have a basic income, then it'll just all go to landlords because the landlords will all just crank up the rent and all of a sudden housing will go through the roof yeah. because it's necessary. So people who own the housing, like, would you, would you have any thoughts on UBI or? Well, yeah, it would depend on a lot more than just UBI. I love the idea that everybody can receive passive income because why should it only be the domain of the lucky few who inherited the wealth to have passive income? Right. You know? exactly. It should be everyone's birthright. That's like somebody who's, you know, in a country that like generates wealth, that some of that wealth be enjoyed by, it. and not just like in terms of public education, but in terms of like, yeah, a social wealth dividend would be, I think, totally uh, fair. Far more fair than just arbitrarily inheriting wealth. Nothing to do with, you know, whether a fairness or anything, just, and the only way it can be defended is pointing to the past, like the aristocracy. And some people want that. They want to be aristocrats. Right. Um, well, actually, that seems to be the trend of all capitalists these days. Right. Is like to enjoy their wealth rather than to reinvest it. Right. It's like to accumulate as much as possible and enjoy it and hold on to it, which is like not what the industrial revolution capitalists were known to do. Well, anyway, so like to answer your friend's question, I do think that there is potential for rent increases, not necessarily just housing, but like people extract rent in all kinds of ways, like totally. rent on car rides, uh, rent on, on running your own lift. Rent on, you know, your, your credit card, rent everywhere, you know, like mm -hmm. a rent, a rent society, mm -hmm. um, which is like some kind of neo-feudalism. Yeah, exactly. So that's one 
way that they could try to like cancel each other out or like like attempt to but I right. think, yeah unless you're uh, challenging these relationships of ownership and property right and i think that can only happen through class conflict right then i think like it's gonna have some setbacks i mean it'll be better than having no welfare state and nothing <laughs> but hopefully you have both like welfare and EBI and maybe a jobs guarantee all coincide and people will say oh isn't that conflicting no I mean like I don't want to get the jobs guarantee because I, I don't know enough about it right. but I do know that it's voluntary it's not like a work to welfare kind of setup. right right yeah because that that's been my only thing about about the job guarantee thing because I'm all in on this basic income idea so yeah. I'm like so is the job guarantee just like kind of like basic income but you gotta work for it no it's like Good jobs for people who want them. Right. <laughs> yeah. so, I don't yeah. know if it'll work. I mean, I don't know. I'm not sitting here saying I'm an advocate of UBI or jobs guarantee. It's not somewhere where I need to do more research, but I, I think UBI would have a big upside. Um, right. and giving people money has a big upside. Right, right. Like totally. more people money. Yeah. <laughs> That's what rent control would do. Um, put uh, $301 million back into people's pockets in Sacramento. Whoa, dang. Over yeah. $6,000 per renter would be saved every year if we had rent control <laughs> totally and that's and that's on and renters aren't saving a ton of money sitting there de collecting dust so the, it'll all be going back into the economy and rejuvenating the yeah i mean people people who don't make a ton of money don't have a lot of freedom to save it you know <laughs> they may try you know and hats off to you if you can a lot of people can't right. so having that six thousand dollars that might be an operation that could save someone's life you know so and we need it if we want to have a humane system that doesn't kill people because they couldn't save the six thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. You know, we need it. Right. Yeah. So I love when the, there was one time when Alexandra Ocasio Cortez was asked, "What is democratic socialism?" on some mainstream show, and she's like, "It's the belief that in the wealthiest country in the world, no one should be too poor to live." I love that. Like it's just so simple. I'm like, "What are you gonna be an asshole? Disagree with that?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people are going to disagree with that. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's scary because right now the right is emboldened, being led by, you know, the 1% uh, Wall Street, and they're complete nihilists. Like, they understand the ramifications of what they're doing. They understand that the climate is, co we're coming to a point of ecological collapse point of no return mm -hmm. they're perfectly aware of it they've been aware of it for decades they don't care they want to build a wall because they have like genocidal ambitions they're gonna say oh how do you say that well just look at what you do i mean look at how the world is today i mean look at what's going on in europe and like the walls that they're constructing and the damage of the world outside of those walls and you see that like what's going on is like crystal clear. It's a total nightmare that they're trying to create. And it's up to us to get off our asses, attend a few meetings if we can, get involved however you can. You don't have to attend every meeting. I didn't know jack shit two years ago. I didn't know anything about rent control. And if you thought anything I said was remotely, I don't know, like informed, it's because I went to meetings. I just went to a lot of meetings. And so you can learn a lot by going to these two. And you should. You should come out to DSA. Uh, you should sign up for DSA. You go to dsausa.org slash join. And that will give you, you know, a membership card. Uh, you'll get emails. And hopefully one from us eventually. It takes a couple months to uh, get the information. But then, you know, we have lots of ways to plug in, um, to participate in, let's say, rent control. Mm -hmm. Or if you, like, care about Medicare for All. Or you have new projects you want to like pursue it's a space to learn how to become an organizer and um, part of a group that does things strategically and builds real paths to power and so that's not something that a lot of other groups can really offer you with as much flexibility as we do and it's a lot of fun so i don't know there's not really a lot of reasons I could think why you shouldn't be doing it unless you've got serious health problems that are <laughs> preventing you from doing stuff or I understand like a lot of people have serious life right. issues, but for the rest of you, <laughs> I see a bright future for us, you know, <laughs> right. it's got to come out. Yeah. Hell yeah. So yeah, I guess that, that seems like a good, uh, sort of concluding notes. Maybe I'll just go to the one last concluding question. Yeah. Um, 
what would be like a one paragraph synopsis of utopia as you see it? Like, what are the most important aspects of a society that's worth fighting for? Ah. A society worth fighting for, one, it, it has to respect all people regardless of difference. So that be gender or race or ethnicity or sexuality or religion. So it has to have absolute respect for that difference and consider that a part of the universal project of humanity to, to have this kind of like, a, not like a abstract universal subject, but one that's like complex and have many different parts. So that's sort of like to borrow from a uh, Aimé Césaire, who's sort of like a, a socialist thinker. And then uh, it has to treat all people with dignity. And that isn't just about recognizing people, but it's about giving them the material basis to, th to have a good life to all people. You know, like, uh, I'm not an abstract egalitarian. Like, I don't think equality equals everyone has the same amount of things mm. or like relatively same good life outcomes. You know, there may be cases where some people need to have more resources than others, you know, mm. but you know, I think the dictum that uh, Marx created, you know, from each according their ability to each according their need, it's a pretty good one. And I think that covers a lot of ground actually, but you know, healthcare, housing, you know, like having a like an enriched life, you know, with free education. I mean, these aren't radical ideas, right? Like, right. But, I mean, they're in the Communist Manifesto. Right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they're just like, the reason that we can't have them in full is, it's not a superficial problem, but it's not, it is an artificial one. Right. And it can be overcome, I think. So I guess like, that kind of summarizes my idea. You know, and obviously giving people a full participation in their own lives, be it their workplace or in society, you know, rather than like your boss has complete control over you on and off the clock sometimes. And what that looks like might be like cooperatives, it might be unions, like full, you know, 100% unionization. Obviously, like I'm 100% for unions. It's like a crime to be treated the way they do. Everyone should be in a union. And that's part of something we do in DSA too, is we talk about how you can unionize workplace. So one more reason to go, because <laughs> I know your boss is screwing you over and you hate them. But you know what? It doesn't it doesn't have to be like a lone fight. You have the resources. So anyway, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a, that, I guess that would be a utopia in a nutshell. I brought all these books. Like I wasn't sure if we were going to talk about like outlandish kind of utopian right. ideas. But these are like more like dilettante, avant-garde style utopian mm. concepts. Right. But um, a little less um, pragmatic and political. Right. Right. That's good. <laughs> yeah. That's totally. Awesome. It's good stuff today. Yeah, I love the abstract, imaginative sorts of uh, far future visions, and um, that that's great too. But I, I don't know, it's so inspiring to know that there's like movement happening. Like yeah. you know, that, I think that's one of the things that people need to understand is that there's fucking movement happening, and it's like there these blood sucking capitalists, like they will not rule us forever. No, <laughs> no. I mean, they're making that quite clear. The, they're gonna destroy the world, so you know, like. <laughs> forever either but we, you don't want to let that happen yeah like I, I did want to say like there's this guy uh who's a, passed away recently eric olin right he wrote a book called envisioning real utopias i can lend it to you if you want yeah totally uh, that's awesome yeah but it's more like these kind of grounded ideas right like, not really it sounds like contradiction terms like a real no place but yeah. um, these are what he thinks are like kind of pathways to a better more just and fair society Hell yeah. Uh, yeah, Marxist uh, philosopher. Really cool. Totally. Hell yeah. Gonna miss him, but uh, you can still read his books. And his syllabuses are still online. But, uh, nice. Totally. Hell yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he taught at uh, Wisconsin. Right. Wisconsin, nice. Yeah. Totally. What's the name Uh Eric Olin Wright. All right. Yeah. E R I K O L I N W R I G H T. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you everybody for joining us. I hope uh, you've learned some helpful things about what can be done about the situation. And uh, I hope you've been encouraged that your landlord doesn't own you the way that the, the feudal system wants to reemerge and make it so. <laughs> yeah, come and help us win this. We can't do it without you. So they're going to spend as much money as they think necessary to defeat it. And that's a lot. So can't let it happen. Got to fight back. So. Mm -hmm. 
Join DSA. Thanks. Hell yeah. See you guys next time. <laughs> We're supposed to do like a rainbow? Oh yeah. <laughs> All memory is an illusion. There is nothing except the present moment. And that there is no future, as equally no past. Poverty and ignorance in all of their senses will always be an issue as long as you've got dichotomous systems, cops and robbers, criminals and law-abiding citizens, knocks and ganja farmers and dealers, lost souls on park benches they call psychotic, that are not of this dimension, corporate con artists and politicians gone awry, foster children in a royal child born with the sangre of reptilians, indigenous and non-indigenous, slaughtered aboriginal goddesses, they simply call lost or missing women, morbid celebrities, so Toxic with Botox, they call gorgeous and heavenly tabloids and esoteric scriptures from past voided by unbearable histories. We lack choice in accepting force fed rhetoric that's horse shit. We all get it, but we're forced to watch it. And of course, we yield nauseous auras and force fields from imposters and prophets, Yahweh and Baphomet, Nostradamus and Muhammad. Peace be upon them, and war be upon those that are wrong. So we rose up and conquered non profits and banking conglomerates. United Nations, the divide and conquer Lies and doctrine from dying dogmas And the rise of ancients trying to talk to us The brightest stars in the darkest waters Heisted minds and remarkable prodigies and champions Atlantis and Gamora Truth revealed by supervillains like MF Doom And stupid superhero figures Patriotically idiotic like Captain America Study Malcolm Garvey, Huey, Martin, Luther and Marley too We need some better logic and honest veteran rhymers Yet lacking verily Forget the garbage but sit through it and recycle parts, calm parts, calm talks and screams and fights at disarmament marches, pacifist meat eaters and warmongering vegans, peaceful insects we call plagues and slaughter in vain, conflicts and wars for progress to pave, all day we talk of the same, yet we barter for change and evolution in the process, authors and artists insane, but isn't it strange what we thought of as sane, regardless, a regal walk in the rain, people in slums in the sun, a conversation with God talking of Bangs, a goddess with silent thoughts exchanged of new moons and true wounds, late bloomers and new school students with great tutors, Professor Xavier and Magneto contained within Legion, the blessed saviors and the evil, it's all just a test to sway you and see if you see through and fathom it all in a glimpse, after the fall and the end there's always a beginning, the cosmos revolving yet constantly evolving, it's endless, I watch as dawn rises with mica patterns and psychoactive sobriety and calm. Yet the path will rise from chasms and the cries of ghastly and vile madness to the skies and its tapestries. For we are all childs of the magic ethers. We are all childs of the magic ethers.